Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone InsyaAllah we will begin our session tonight First and foremost, Alhamdulillah the greatest gratitude to Allah SWT for the opportunity to conduct a talk before we start our new semester A very warm welcome to our honorable brothers and sisters to our program tonight We encourage all the participants to switch on the camera Before we begin, let us start our session with Umar Kita and Fatih Your brother and sister, for your information, this talk is a collaboration between KNMS, the Sanitization Unit, and the Awah and Chinese. And tonight, we are going to talk about a very interesting topic as students, which is ethics of technology. Before we start our session, let me introduce our speaker for tonight's session. Our first speaker is Associate Professor Dr. Ibrahim Mutahir. For your information, Dr. Ibrahim is an Associate Professor at the Department of Economics, Dr. Ibrahim graduated from the Department of Sharia'ah at the top of his class thesis, Bachelor in Sharia'ah and Islamic Studies at the International Islamic University, Madinah. Dr. Ibrahim also an advisor and speaker for many Muslim student bodies in universities all across Malaysia, delivering hundreds of all hundreds of, all of Islamic lecture and our program. He is well known for conducting free weekly classes breaking from Akida, Fiqh, Asir, Usul, and others, which are attended by many students and lecturers. Dr. Ibrahim is also the director and a founder of another educational foundation, which is working to alleviate the difficulty and fulfill the needs of poor, poor, poor Muslims in Nigeria and elevate them with education. So here is the background of our honorable speaker. Hopefully, we can be an attentive audience in our session tonight. And for your information, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the session. If you have any question, you may ask at the end of the session. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our special guest tonight, Dr. Ibrahim Mutahir, to deliver the talk. The floor is here. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala ma'uthi rahmatillil alameen and nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim amma ba'd. Jazakumullah uh, khairan for giving me this uh, opportunity to be speaking uh, before you. And I guess uh, we are going to be dealing with uh, the new uh, student to uh, the faculty, uh, am I right? Yeah, so that's uh, marked the importance of uh, these type of uh, speeches. And uh, I congratulate you and welcome you to the Kulia of Economics. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a successful uh, choice that you have made. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you tawfiq in this dunya as well as the akhirah. Uh, to begin, I should say that uh, the most important thing that a Muslim uh, does to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after being guided to Islam is to seek knowledge. Uh, in fact, there is uh, nothing in Islam that is uh, greater than the knowledge. Imam Muhammad used to say that a knowledge is the best thing somebody does to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with as long as a person is sincere. As long as there is sincerity, knowledge is the best thing you do to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's much greater than even jihad fi sabirillah according to the statement of some scholars. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates those who believe amongst you and the student of knowledge as well as the scholars darajat in ranking. So the best way to bring yourself up into that prestigious, uh, prestigious uh, status is to seek the knowledge of Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man yurid allahu bi khayran yufaqihu fi deen. Because the story short, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for a person, he will give him ability to learn the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are so many incidences 
and uh, situations and circumstances where the Prophet Sallallahu taught us the importance of knowledge in, in Islam. And you can see this is almost the only thing that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala commanded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ask for an increase. When he says, always say, Ya Allah, increase me in knowledge. Ya Allah, increase me in knowledge. So something that the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek for an increase in that nature. That should be the best thing somebody should be busy with. And that was the attitude of the prophets before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Musa alayhi salam was speaking to uh, his uh, companions and the people in the community. It was a very powerful speech. He was excited. It was an interesting topic. He was talking to them. So after the lecture, somebody told him, Musa, do you know somebody who is better than you? Musa alayhi salam said, no. And of course, he's talking about knowledge. Do you know somebody who is better than you in knowledge? Who knows more than you? Musa alayhi salam said, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Yes, there is somebody who is more knowledgeable than you. Because that answer given by Musa alayhi salam was wrong. Because at least if you couldn't reflect and remember anyone from amongst the human beings or jinns or angels who is better than you in terms of knowledge, Allah is always there. Allah is always there, the source of knowledge itself. Allah says, So when Allah told him, there is somebody who knows more than you, Musa alayhi salam said, Ya Allah, man huwa? Who is that person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abduna khidr bi majmil bahrain. Our slave khidr, who you can find, you know, when you go to majmul bahrain, the place where the two seas are meeting each other. And subhanallah, Musa immediately asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, kaifa safil ilayhi? He said, Ya Allah, how can I meet you? Ya Allah, how can I meet him? Immediately Musa told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, how can I see him? How can I meet him? So that shows the importance of knowledge. You know, this is a prophet of Allah, not just a prophet of Allah and his messenger, but he was the best at that time. There was nobody who was better than Musa alayhi salam at that time. The best human being that exists on earth at that time was Musa alayhi salam. When he heard that there is somebody who knows better than him, he quickly went, to that person to take the knowledge from, from him. You can trace this in the Quran in so many places. One of the worst, you know, type of creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, you know, is a dog. But a dog that has knowledge, it has value in Islam, even. You know, if you keep a dog in your house uh, for no reason, just as a pet, Every single day you are losing, you know, like the size of the amount of uhud of your reward every day. SubhanAllah. This is not the sin a person is getting, but the reward will be taken from you every day if you don't have a purpose of keeping a dog. And these purposes are restricted by the Prophet Sallallahu He says, whoever keeps a dog in his house, not for the purpose of protecting his sheep, his animals, or protecting his, his, uh, his farm, or not for the sake of hunting. Three things mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, uh, 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 mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, as a base and justification for a person to keep a dog at home. If you do that without having these justifications, every day you lost, you know, not less than the size of the amount of Uhud, which is around five kilometers of your reward. And this dog, which is treated in this way, if this dog is to acquire a knowledge of how to hunt, how to defend, how to protect, it has a value in Islam. Allah wants to talk about it in the Quran when he says, Allah. A bird, you know, the hoopoe, al hudhud You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted, granted him this favor and blessing. Is mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that mention remains until the day of judgment. He was praised because of the knowledge. 
Adam alayhi salam was created long after the creation of the angels. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored him because of the knowledge. And there we go, my dear brothers and sisters. If I sit here to count number of hadith and the misus and the ayat that are talking directly and indirectly about the importance of knowledge, we'll finish this lecture without being able to mention them all. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, pay attention to that which brought you to the university, which is to seek the knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This knowledge, which is so important, there are certain conditions and adab to be met in order a person to get the best of it. In order for a person to get the best of knowledge, there must be some adab that this person has to be upon. If you lose one of them, your learning process will be deficient. At the end of the day, you might end up getting nothing except regret. Number one, the most important adab that a student of knowledge should have is the sincerity, al-ikhlas. Sincerity is the, 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 the key you know, to the success in everything you're doing in this life. Whatever you do, if you are not sincere for the sake of, you're not doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah, you're going to lose your dunya and you lose the akhirah. The Prophet said, Actions are judged by the intention. You know, if you have good intention, Allah SWT will take you from you. If you have a good intention, Allah SWT will accept it. If your intention is pure and clean, only for Allah SWT, you will be rewarded for that. So it is based on what you have intended, Allah SWT is going to support you in that learning. And the Prophet said, whoever learns something, which is supposed to be done for the sake of Allah, and he is doing it, not because of anything except to acquire this little amount of the dunya or to argue, to engage in a debate with others. That was the purpose of his learning. This is going to be a regret. And at the end of the day, he will end up finding himself in the hellfire what he has even now. That's why I invite you, my dear brothers and sisters, student, to always remember this fact, that your time has a great value. Your time has a great value. As a Muslim, you shouldn't waste a single second in your life. And believe me, my dear brothers and sisters, whatsoever second you waste, you know, in the, the stay you are going to be having in the university or wherever you are studying, it is going to turn into a regret against you on the day of judgment. It is going to turn into a regret against you on the day of judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talk in that famous hadith narrated by Abu Huraira, which Muawiyah or Abu Huraira himself, whenever he recited this hadith, he faints. When he was narrating the hadith, you know, one of them when he was narrating the hadith, he fainted. He came back again. He tried to narrate the hadith, he fainted again. He came back again. He tried to narrate the hadith, he fainted again, three times. SubhanAllah. Why was that? Because of the impact of that hadith on his heart. What is this hadith? The hadith that talks about the first three people that Allah SWT will command the angels to take them to hell. The first three people that Allah SWT will command the angels to take them to hell. Number one is Ali. The first one was a scholar. Who used to teach? You know, who used to learn? We used to engage in education, educating the nation. But at the end of the day, he was not doing each and every one of these efforts. He wasn't doing them for the sake of Allah. At the end of the day, when he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him, what did you do with my blessing? The knowledge that I have granted you because knowledge is blessed, is a blessing. It's the most powerful and the greatest blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted a person after Islam. Imagine a life whereby every single thing is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sin. I really want you to reflect upon this. Imagine a life every, whereby every single creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show mercy upon you. 
When do you get that? When you engage in learning the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you engage in learning that which is beneficial to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, fi juhriha. Including the insects, the ants in the holes, they are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive their sins. The fish are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive their sins. Wherever you go, the angels, when they meet you, they put their feathers down, their feathers down out of respect to you. And you'll be walking on the path of paradise wherever you go. SubhanAllah. This is the life of a student of knowledge, although you don't see it physically, but it is a reality. It is a fact. Why is it a fact? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said it. So it is a blessing, it's an honor, it's a favor that Allah SWT is granting some of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that they have ability to engage in seeking knowledge. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him, what did, you, what did you do with my blessing? What did you do with it? He will say, Ya Allah, qara'atu fiqa al-Qur'ana wa aqra'atu. Say, Ya Allah, I have recited the Qur'an for your sake. Wa aqra'atuhu. And I have taught people the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your sake. SubhanAllah. You say, Ya Allah, I have learned and I taught others and all of these I am doing them for your sake to please you, Ya Allah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what was in the, the heart. That which you are hiding in your heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it. You can hide it from me, from uh, your lecturers, from your friends, from everyone, from your parents, but you cannot hide it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya alam al-sidda wa akhfa. So on that day, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Yawma Tubul al-Sara'i. Yawma Tubul al-Sara'i. The day in which the secrets are going to be revealed. On that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose that which was in the heart. Everyone thought that that sheikh and the students were doing everything for the sake of Allah. But not knowing that the reason why they are studying in the university is for the sake of getting good job in the future. There is no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their mind. The reason why they are studying in the university so that in the future they call them doctors, you know, and professors and all of these things. They have no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their mind. The reason why they are seeking I mean, the education is just because they want to be famous, you know, on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells that person, this is what you're looking for in that life. You are reading the Quran, you are teaching people the righteous uh, thing to be done. But unfortunately, you are not doing it for the sake of Allah. Allah says, وَقَدْ قِيلَ And definitely people used to say, what a nice sheikh, what an excellent scholar, what an expert. You know, people said all of these words that we have been hearing them around our community. So you got what you're looking for, Allah SWT will reply him. SubhanAllah. And then Allah SWT will command the angels and they will drag him on his face to Jahannam. So I guess my dear brothers and sisters, this hadith should be more than enough for every one of us to fix our intention. You're joining the university now, or you're already in the university, this is the best time for you to look into your intention. You know what exactly intention is and fix it. It is not something difficult to be done. You just have to fix your intention by letting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala see in your heart, being pure and clean only for his sake. You're doing whatever you're doing to please him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will step into your education. Many students among your predecessors, my dear brothers, brothers and sisters, they suffered so much before the graduation. Many of them struggled a lot to graduate on time, but they couldn't. Many of them failed. Many of them graduated with a very low grade. And I can tell you, many others also found themselves into that situation because they are too far from the support. What is the support? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rabbul alameen. The only support you have in your education to expand your thinking and your brain and learning capability is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're doing it for him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will step into your journey. Allah will be with you. Allah will ease the understanding, things which many people might not be able to get it clear, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it always clear to you. That's the power of sincerity. When you do things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you in whatsoever you are doing. So do remember this, my dear brothers and sisters, the first attitude and the quality, you know, that 
the, 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 the adab that a student of knowledge should have is the sincerity. The second after sincerity is patience. Brothers and sisters, knowledge needs patience. And actually in this life, there is no way for you to succeed unless if you're patient. Yeah, patience is the key to success. The last Muhammad when he talks about the predecessors and the previous nations, you know, he talked about Nuh alayhi salam, you know, that man, my dear brothers and sisters, spent 950 years inviting his people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody accepted him except a few. He spent 950 years, almost 1,000, almost 1,000 years. That's why in Surah al ankabut Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا Nuh lived with his people, inviting them to Islam for 1,000 years with the exception of 50 years. Imagine he never get bored. What kind of patience is this? 950 years. And guess how many people accepted him? You know that there are some scholars who said only four people accepted him. 950 years. This is the best example of patience. Sabr. When you are looking for something that is so important, and the most important thing after the shahada training is, is the knowledge. You really need to be patient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after talking about Nuh alayhi salam and the struggle he had encounter, you know, in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by bringing his people to the truth. But unfortunately, he received nothing except rejection by those people. He never complained until the last minute after 950 years. He told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't think these people will ever accept Islam. They persecuted him. It, it, I mean, put him into hardship and difficulty. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stepped in and they lost. They lost their life. And they lost the dunya and they lost the akhir. After all of these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka min anba in faybi nuhiha ilayk, ma kunta ta'alamuha anta wala qawmuka min qabli hadha, fa'asbir in the akhirat al muttaqib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is part of the stories of the unseen, which one of that when it happened, he was talking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of that when Nuh was trying to convince his people to be patient, but none of them was willing to listen. He says, ma kunta ta'alamuha anta wala qawmuka min qabli hadha, fa'asbir, Allah SWT told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fasbir, be patient. You want to succeed? Allah SWT says, be patient. So you have to be patient, especially when dealing with your lecturers and the scholars. Patience with your colleagues. And this is one of also the attitudes that I that shall be mentioned, but let me put it here. You know, when talking about colleagues, you must have a company. You cannot live alone. Allah SWT did not create us in the way we can survive alone. You must have somebody who is going to be in your company. These are the friends, right? But this is the most dangerous thing somebody, you know, is doing if he doesn't do it in the, in the right way. Many people went to hell. Many people lost their dunya. Many people end up depressed, committing suicide. And that is rooted back to the choice they have made in terms of friend, the friends they are taking. Many, many. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa advises the very unique hadith when he says, la tusahib illa mu'minin. He says, la tusahib illa mu'minin. Don't you ever accept somebody to become your friend except a good believer. Believe me, my dear students, even in the university you are living, we are not equal. You have people who are not supposed to be closer to you. That's why you have to open your eyes and look into the, 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 the surrounding to select from the best somebody who's really serious in his education. Somebody who's serious. This is the person that should be your friend as long as he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you don't take this advice and you go and choose random and get somebody who is a loser, you will end up being a loser also like that. You end up being a loser also like that's why a poet was right when he says, إِذَا مَا صَحِبْتَ الْقَوْمَ أَصْحَبْكِ يَا رَبِّ وَلَا تَصْحَبِ الْأَرْضَ فَتَبْدَى مَا أَرَّدِي 
whenever you want to uh, take a friend, you know, take the best in the community. Do not agree to be with the loser because you are going to lose also in the way they lost. That's why long ago in Arabic, they used to say a sahib sahib. A friend is like a dragger, somebody who dragged you because they drag you to their own attitude and manners. So as a student in the university, as a student in a college, as a student in whatever you are studying, you must make sure that you fill your time with good friendship. You choose the best. Don't you ever take somebody to be a friend except somebody who is better than you in terms of education. This is my personal advice to you out of love for your success, my dear brothers and sisters. Don't you ever agree with somebody to be a close friend of yours except somebody who is better than you. If you couldn't find such a person, then take at least somebody who is equal to you. This is the person that will remind you to study. This is the person that will remind you to respect your teachers. This is the person that will remind you to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be patient. This is the person that will remind you to be dedicated and a hard worker, somebody who works very hard to make sure that he acquires a knowledge cook. You need these kind of friends. Somebody, whenever you see him, you remember that you have a responsibility on your shoulder. They have to go back and visit him. Be very careful, my brother and sisters. It seems to be so fancy, you know. They show here and there, they take you out of the university every single moment you play in your life. The vast majority of it is all about playing. Do remember, my dear brothers and sisters, your time is very limited. It's also one of the added time management will come back to it, inshallah. Do not waste your time with those people whose time have no value at all in their life. So take the best person and be patient. You might get things which you don't like. You know, they might be advising you in the way it goes against your interests. But subhanAllah, and they're, if they're honest, that's why we emphasize on righteousness because a righteous person will never advise you to go against that which is benefiting you in this life. But do remember that sometimes you might see your interest in something, but unfortunately there is nothing of that nature in it. It's none other than something that will harm your life. Your friend can see, but you don't see it. They remind you, they tell you, don't, don't go for this because you're going to be in trouble at the end of the day. And you don't see it that much. If you're going to disobey them and go and do it at the end of the day, you regret. And nobody's going to benefit you at the end of the day. So be patient with them. So patience is necessary. As I said, especially patience with the scholars. SubhanAllah, you're going to meet a lot in your journey. Different types of scholars. Different types of mentality. Some people are very, uh, very calm, you know. Some people are a bit harsh. This is all for your own benefit. Usually, naturally, we like, we like the one who is very soft. You know, let us do whatever we want. SubhanAllah. But this is one picture of it, you know, to maintain the balance. At the same time, we have somebody who is really harsh. But we always see it as somebody who is against us. I study long ago at the university. I know lecturers who are rejected by many students, you know, subhanAllah. We you know, largely report against them many times. And those lecturers, I know that very well. They were looking for nothing except how to benefit the student. They were very strict. But they were strict in the right way. They don't accept laziness in it. You have to study that course so much for you to win. And for you to score, good. That's why we have seen so many people also who pass with good grades their courses. If they're just harsh to harm, they will not let those students pass. But they are observing the harshness so that people will be serious in their learning. So be positive, my dear, uh, my dear brothers and sisters. Be positive. Whoever you study with, you need to be patient with first. And focus on your, on your education and make sure that you get the best. How long are you going to be with your lectures? Mostly four years. Except if you decide to go for masters and PhD, then you have five more years. If you are serious in your education, 
in around 10 years. In comparison to your life, it's very little. What I'm trying to say is, do remember that you're not going to stay with this person forever. And he does have something which is beneficial to your life. If you're angry and you're sad, you know, and you rejected him and you become somebody who is not serious in his class, at the end of the day, who lost? You lost. You might end up fading that cause and the lecturer doesn't care. He shouldn't care actually because he wasn't doing something wrong against you. So observe patience. No matter how much shaitan comes and tells you that your teacher is this, your teacher is that, please do understand that the most valuable items you're looking for in this life is knowledge and this person has something to guide you in that nature. Be patient. Leave him with his intention between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and focus on that which you can get from him. You're not going to stay with him forever. After you graduate, be somebody if you want. Although this is not good, but focus on your education and understand the value of the scholars and respect them wherever you see them. It's also one of the adab, respecting the scholars. Because there is no way for a student of knowledge to succeed as long as he is not respecting his course. Please open your eyes properly. You're going to be learning an institution which is quite old. You see different types of mentalities. In your class, you might confront a student who is not respecting the teacher. Do not imitate that. He's a real loser in this life. And if you imitate him, you're going to lose also. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the barakah from from your knowledge. Res disrespecting the scholars is very dangerous because you might meet somebody who is very righteous and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the scholars, they are the more likely, most likely people to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than others. As long as they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء The real person who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst his slaves uh, are the uh, scholars. The real one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the scholar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restricts knowledge to, to the taqwa. So you might be confronted by somebody who is wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you hate him, you fight him, you disrespect him, and he's your teacher trying to benefit you. You're fighting who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man li waliyan faqad If you fight my wali, it's like you are waging war against me, Allah subhanahu wa says. He said, fighting against me is like waging, fighting against my wali is like waging war against me. Believe me, my dear students, to my knowledge, I have never come across somebody whose attitude is to disrespect his scholars and at the same time he succeeds. Never come across. I wish we had time to quote from the narrations of the early scholars about those people who disrespected their scholars and how did they end their life? It was tragedy. Believe it or not, my dear brothers, sisters, it was tragedy. There is no way for a person to disrespect his scholars and succeed at the same time. And don't you ever say that, no, 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 they're not teaching me Islam, they're teaching me the deen. Yeah, that's because you don't understand Islam correctly. Because Islam is a combination of what? The deen and the dunya. The deen and the dunya, you have religious affairs and you have the dunya and the old affairs. Both of them you are supposed to observe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever happened to teach you that which is beneficial to you and to the Muslim community and to the world in general, this is your teacher who deserves your respect. So this respect of the scholars is one of the biggest, you know, and the most important keys that can lead a student of knowledge to success. And no matter how much you see you know, of negative behavior coming from your chef, do not disrespect him. Even if you have somebody that you think he's disrespecting you, you shouldn't reply him with the best. I'm sorry, we sh you shouldn't reply him with the, with the worst. You shouldn't reply him with the same way he is doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ability here, he ahsan. Always reply with the best. Wallahi, my dear brothers and sisters, if there is somebody who deserves your good reply by your scholars, those people are sacrificing. And whatever you pay, don't you ever be deceived that you're paying. You know, sometimes we must say, oh, I'm paying for this. You know, I deserve this, 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 and that. No. 
you cannot pay for knowledge. There is no way for you to pay for that because it leads to paradise. And you can't buy paradise by your money. This is just a mutual agreement between you and your lecturers that they agree to sacrifice some part of your time to come and benefit. And as such, those scholars, wherever you can find them, they deserve our respect. The Prophet said, Laysa minna, malam yuakil kabirana, malam yuakil kabirana, walam yarham sadirana, wala ya'arifu li'alim al haq. The one who does not respect our elders, and the one who does not show mercy to the younger ones, and the one who does not respect our scholars is not one of us, the Prophet said. I'm saying this to you because you're new. This environment, most of you, you're going to be having some mentalities that they lost at them. And the way they behave towards the lecturers is really wrong. You're going to see an environment sometimes, the lecturer is passing, he has to tell the student, please give me a chance to pass. And they see him. They see him come in, and he has to come to them and tell them, please, give me a place to pass. In the past, it was not like that. But they see his caller, before he looked for any permission, they give him chance to pass. When they walk, they give him chance to walk in front of them. That's the adab we learn from our elders. They wait for him to pass. Why is that? Because of the knowledge he has. My dear students, angels, when they see a scholar, they put their feathers down out of respect for him. Why can't we do that for our scholars? So the Prophet said, if your attitude is not to respect the scholars, he said, you are not one of us. And it's a very strict statement. He said to Muhammad, especially the people in the Muslim community. So this respect is necessary for somebody to succeed in learning. Imam Muhammad used to say, the humble ulama in Muslimah. And please open your ears and listen to this book. He used to say, the humble ulama in Muslimah. Man shammaha marid wa man akalaha mat. He used to say that the flesh of the scholars is poisonous. You know, we backbite sometimes, right? We talk against others behind the back. And subhanAllah, these days, this is a lot. People sit down and talk against others behind the back. We have this attitude from students a lot. And sometimes a person will pass, you know, people are complaining a lot. You pass, you don't want to pass through some people because they look at you and laugh sometimes. SubhanAllah, Wallahi, this is very unfortunate. You know, that's why the Prophet said, Iyakum al Jalus ala Turaqat. Iyakum al Jalus ala Turaqat. He said, I warn you from sitting at the side of the roads. They said, Ya Rasulullah, he majalisuna malin abud. They say, Ya Rasulullah, these are places of rest and you We didn't have any, anything to do other than staying in this. We didn't have any other place, Ya Rasulullah. He said, But if you believe that you have to sit at the side of the roads, you should give the right of the road. Applying the salam, closing, lowering your gaze, respecting others, not harming anyone. SubhanAllah, who is observing this? Except a few. Who is observing this? Except, except a few. So Imam Muhammad says, the flesh of a scholar is poisonous. It's like poison. If you were to smell it, you will get sick. And whoever but right is called, he is equal to a dead, moving person. Yeah, when you are backbiting somebody, that's hatred. And if you're hating a person, you should get ready to fight Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, my dear students, do remember sincerity and patience. Patience with the scholars and patience with the, the, the friends and also patient with the knowledge you have. It needs patience. One of the adab is having a good strategy in learning. Have a schedule, a plan properly, which we call time management, managing your time properly. This is really, really, really important. Agree or not, my dear brothers and sisters, most of the students in the university lost because of time management. They failed to manage their time properly. 
time is very valuable asset in your life. You don't manage it properly, it goes. And it is the only thing that when it goes, you cannot bring it back to rectify it. And therefore, as a student of knowledge, sit down at the beginning of your study. This is my personal advice. Organize your time properly. You know, have a good and excellent schedule, which should no compromise to waste of time at all. Every single second in your life, your journey to, 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 to knowledge should be counted and calculated and managed properly. That's how you will succeed. Allah, that's how you succeed. The scholars have mentioned this and talk about it. And the, the whole sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at it, you know, the focus on time is a lot in it. So look into your time, my dear brothers, brothers and sisters. We have 24 hours in a day. We have 10 hours in it. Are they enough? Most of the students will say, we are very busy, you know. It looks like we don't have time, you know. That's why we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, you know. They neglected so many things because they believe they're busy. And they convince themselves they're busy. Unfortunately, they convince themselves that they're busy. And if you talk about the reality, you have 24 hours in a day. In the university, averagely, usually the university takes from you five hours. Five hours. In the university, usually five hours will be taken by you. Out of 24 hours, how much you have left? Nine, 19, sorry. You have 19. Five hours are taken, you have 19 hours. 19 hours, if you're a smart student, take two hours from them. Believe me, my dear student, you know, two hours is more than, they are more than enough, you know, for you to revise what you have studied in the classroom for the past five hours. Take two hours from those 19 hours. This is just for your revision and give them to your revision. Yeah, what happens is, yes, I give two hours, but within these two hours, I play with this, I talk to this, I do this, I do this, I reply my WhatsApp, I check my Facebook, I go to the YouTube, I do so many things which are going to distract me and take from those two hours, a lot of it. But believe me, my dear brothers and sisters, if you go to the classroom, and you learn from the scholars, you know, and you come back home and you give two hours, straight forward two hours with no break, you know, sitting down, just revising what you have taught, you know, what you have been taught in the classroom by your lecturers, inshallah, inshallah, believe it or not, my dear brothers and sisters, your focus during the examination would be at the minimum. Because by the time the semester finish, almost everything is stored, then you're bringing. But what is the attitude of the student during the exams? Nobody is resting. Because we start revising that which we are taught, you know, by our lecturers in the classroom, we start revising it. The revision week, or to be more honest, more particular, the night before the exams. That's why I put you our students, you know, every time you go to the exam hall, you see them being busy, mashallah. Everyone is focusing. Even the salam they don't hear it properly because now they're focusing so much. Imagine, my dear brothers, sisters, you have been given an information for the past four months, you know, and you want to memorize them in one night. How does that work? And sometimes you have two papers in one day. You want to memorize and revise everything you want. And when the examination is a bit tough, it has to be tough actually, even if it is so easy, it will be tough for you because some of these things this is the first time you are listening to them. Add to that also nowadays in the classrooms, unfortunately, we have a lot of entertainment and distraction in the classroom. Unfortunately, very unfortunate. You come to the classroom with your phone, with your uh, uh, tablet, you know, with so many things, you know. The teacher is teaching, he has to keep on tech, uh, talking to the student, please focus. You know. What kind of learning, uh, I mean, process we, we, we're dealing with nowadays? You know. How do you expect to, to get everything? You know, in the past, 
when the teacher, when the lecturer is talking, everyone is focusing in the teacher and what he's saying. If you see somebody looking at something else, is a person who is putting the pen on the paper and writing that which the lecturer is mentioned. Nowadays, no. You have to be busy trying to fight people to even focus in the classroom. This is really a wrong adept and behavior. Disrespect to the knowledge, disrespect to the lecturer, and also disrespect against yourself also because at the end of the day, you are going to pay the price, which many of your predecessors have been paying that, that price. So believe me, this attitude of suffering during the examination, people are having a you know, problem with this. Yeah. Sleeping, why? Because they cannot relax. You know, they have a lot of worries in the heart. This could be solved if you follow this advice. Go to the classroom and focus. That's why my advice to all of you, my dear students, when you get into the classroom, switch off your phone. Off. Not silent, no, it is off. Okay. Wish you everyone has his own room. I would say keep it in your room. Don't even bring it to the, to the, to the, to the class. Be patient. It's all about one, one and a half hours. The lecture is going to be taken for you. Be patient. That one hour switch off the phone. Train yourself. It is possible, my dear brothers and sisters. Believe me, it's possible. Switch off the phone. Because if you put it on the silent mode, your heart is still connected to it. From time to time, you will be taking it to see who is the person who is, I mean, that is missing. You might vibrate, you know, and then you take it and see, you know, and then you will see a friend of yours that you cannot make, ignore. You will forget the value of what you're learning. You will go back to the friend and lose everything the lecturer is saying. At the end of the day, if you are smart, you have to go and look for uh, the note from other students. What is this? I know it is very tough and difficult for you to observe it, but if you're looking for success in learning, you should be the one actually who is looking for success in learning. You should apply this when you come to the classroom, put your phone on off your mode, off it completely so that you can focus in the classroom. After you take note of whatever could you take it, when you go to your room, the first thing after you rest, is to go back to your notes and study whatever the teacher told you in the class. If you have some questions, search for them. If you couldn't find the answer to that, look for the lecturer tomorrow. If you can email him, email him. Don't wait until the next class comes, you know. Email him, let him understand that he's dealing with a very serious student. In the classroom, he's going to focus on you because you show him, you show him interest in learning. So we have taken seven hours from your time. And now we are left with how many hours? You know, five hours. You know, we have 19 hours left. And you take two more hours, you have 17 hours left. You have 17 hours left. What do you do with these 17 hours? If you take eight hours out of 17, you know, and you sleep for eight hours, which I doubt. So I live in the university. I know the kind of life students are having. They don't sleep in the university. But even if we were to be, to be moderate and say that people are sleeping for eight hours, you still have how many hours left out of 17? You have nine hours left. These nine hours are extra time you have in your life. What did you do with them? Brothers and sisters, time management is very important. Anyone who failed in the university, the vast majority of them, they are failing because of their negligence. People come to the place and they don't even know the basic, you know, that much of some of the discipline. But because they're so hard working, they manage to do it. They manage to do it. I remember two siblings, you know, male and a female. You know, I taught them long ago, both of them, when they were young in the school. But subhanAllah, the observation given by the lecturers and the teachers, is that the boy among them was so smart that unfortunately is very playful. He doesn't focus on his education. He doesn't care, very negligent. And the girl does not have that capacity in the way he has. She's not as smart as his, but she was very hardworking. That's why she graduated with good grades as long as he, I mean, at the time where he was struggling to see which university can accept him because of his grades. That's how it is here. 
as the Arab says, man jadda wa jad. If you're serious and you have worked so hard and you ask Allah Allah to bless your hard working, you will make it. Even if your brain doesn't have that huge capacity to grasp every, everything, Allah SWT will let you make it because of that. So time management, my dear brothers and sisters, is really important. And that's emphasized also more on the importance of looking for the good friends. Those people who don't waste their time in anything they do in the university. So my dear brothers and sisters, plus sincerity, to do everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second attitude is patient. Patient with your education, patient with your lectures, and patient with your good friends. The next manner and adab that you have to be preserving is time management. To manage your time properly. It's really, really, really important to manage your time. One of the adab mentioned by the scholars is being moderate in the following. Sleeping and the food you are eating. Yeah, I know this is something that you might listen to it. That you might not listen to it that much because I'm touching the interest of most of us. You know, eating a lot causes you know the brain to have deficiency in terms of learning capacity. In the Quran, the focus is always on the fresh not how much you eat. The last one to want to take from the fresh. We are not told by the Sharia to look for the harsh food. As some people might accept it because they want to live ascetic life. You know, they want to live that kind of uh, ascetic life. So they will eat always harsh food. And this is one of the causes of the deficiency in the memory. You eat fresh. But make sure that you don't eat a lot. The Prophet said, Ma mala abnu adama, we are and sharram min batim. If there is any bag or sack that you make it full with something, it's your stomach. The Prophet said, he says it is always enough for you to take two spoons to strengthen your back bone rather than eating a lot. When you eat a lot, what happens? It becomes fat, it becomes so huge, you know. This fatness that you see, some of it is natural. So you don't blame the one who is suffering from it because this is how Allah SWT created it. But most of it, believe me, is not natural. It's because we eat too much. Imam Shavi said, he said, I've never, never met a person who's so fat and huge and at the same time he is smart except one, one of his scholars, Muhammad bin Hassan. So as I said, you have two types. You have the natural one and you have the acquired one. The one that the person eats too much, so much until the time you become so big. It affects so, almost everything, especially when it comes to the knowledge you're learning. The process is going to be very, very good. It says, لا تحشو بطنك بالطعام تسامونا فدسوم أهل العلم غير سماني this Abu Muhammad, one of the scholars, he says, don't you ever fill your stomach with food, trying to become so big. He says, because you have to know, as a student of knowledge, you must know that the, the scholar's body is not, is not huge. Likewise, sleep in too much. I will advise you to sleep early. Sleep in early. It's really important to the brain. Sleep early. If you don't have anything to do, sleep right after Isha prayer. And wake up at 12 you know, or 1 and then study. That's the best time for study. That's the best time for studying. You reflect more. You think more. You think freshly. Sleep early. Many of us, we just sit down in the restaurant, you know, and spend time in, and longer time in the restaurant, watching nothing except useless things on the TV which are not going to add any credit to my dunya or the akhir. That's why the scholar said, one of the things that a student of knowledge is very quick in them is eating. Who is practicing this in, in the universities? Only a few of them. When I say eating quickly, I don't mean that you eat in the way you'll be harmed, but 
do not waste time when you are eating food. You know, you don't eat a lot, but when it comes to eating, you don't waste time. Eat very quickly because you need the time to go and put them in something else. One of these attitudes is humbleness. You have to be humble. The Prophet said, nobody became humble except that Allah SWT elevated them. Especially when you're dealing with your, your, your scholars, you know, your teachers, your lecturers, you must be humble. You should be humble with everyone. But I'm just saying in particular, especially when dealing with the scholars, you, know, you really need to be humble. Because this will help them to understand that you are a very good student who need their support. And they will stretch their hands and support you before you look for it. One of these manners mentioned by the scholars is the Ramul estate, is the plan, reading a lot. As a student of knowledge, you have to read a lot. Don't wait for the lecturers to give you everything. Although nowadays, this is the attitude of our students, you know, every single thing you have to be given. Every single thing you have to be given. But this is not the good attitude of, of a student. You must read a lot. The teacher is just a guide in the classroom. Of course, outlines of the slides, they are just a guide in the classroom. You should try your best and expand your knowledge, you know, uh, by yourself. Get some other things, you know, come and share, you know, with the teacher in, in the classroom. One of these uh, manners, which is very, very, very important, you know, after uh, talking about the arrogance, is Adamu al not being shy when it comes to asking knowledge. The scholar said, two people cannot learn their life. One of them is a shy person, and the second one is mistaken, somebody who's arrogant. That's against the humbleness. I always tell my students, when you come to the classroom, drop down your shyness at the, at the, at the gate, at the door. Keep it. It doesn't mean she should be Khalil and Adam disrespecting everyone in the class, but we're talking about shyness when it comes to asking about the knowledge in the classroom. Many people don't have the courage to ask the teacher in the classroom because they're in the presence of their colleagues. And this is very wrong. This is very wrong. You should always convince yourself that you're alone in the class when it comes to asking questions. You just convince yourself that you're alone in the class. So just ask. Whatever comes to your mind, just ask. The only thing is that we have to be honest. Aisha radiallahu anha used to say that I really love the sisters from the Ansar. She said the reason why I love them so much it is because of the fact that they never became shy of asking about that which benefited them in, in, their, in their life. Whenever they need something, they just go and ask. Um Sulaim came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, Inna Allah la yistahi min al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't feel shy of saying the truth. She said, فَهَلَ عَلَى الْمَرْأَةِ مِنْ غُسْلٍ إِذَا هِيَ احْتَلَمَتْ She said, Ya Rasulullah, this is the presence of some companions. She said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not feel shy of asking for, uh, I'm sorry, does not feel shy of saying the truth. She said, Ya Rasulullah, is it wajib upon a sister to take ghusl of Janaba when she sees a wet dream? The Prophet said, look at her, he said, yes. It is wajib upon her to do it when she sees the water coming out of her, just like the way it happens with the brothers. SubhanAllah, one of the, the wives of the Prophet was there. She put her, her head down, you know. She was too shy to hear this. How is it possible for a woman to come and ask this question to a man? You know? And Aisha at the same time was saying, I really love the sisters from the Ansar because they never been deprived, you know, from asking questions because of their shyness. That's why the scholars say, لا يتعلم أثنان مستحين ومستقبل The person who is shy will never learn. And the person who is arrogant will never learn. So respect should be maintained. But ask the scholars, whenever you don't understand something, don't worry about anyone who is next to you. Just ask the teacher. One of the bad attitudes we practice in the classroom is the teacher is teaching. And I have a question, you know, about what he's saying. Instead of asking the teacher, I ask my, my friend. We found it okay, but this is not okay. 
this is wrong. Because what happened is that if you are asking the, what do you call, the, 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 the friend, by the time you are asking him, the lecturer is still speaking. So you're losing what the lecturer is talking about at that moment. And it is not necessary that you will understand what your friend is telling you. At the end of the day, you might be forced to go back to the lecture and ask him about the same question you're asking your friend. So you lost huge amount of knowledge that the lecturer has been talking about in the class when you were asking your friend. And at the same time, also, you couldn't get the friend's answer correctly. That's why the best method in the classroom when the lecturer is speaking is not to talk to your friends at all. Whenever you have something to say, ask the lecturer. What is he going to do? He will pause the lecture and answer your question. First. You see, you benefit, the students are going to benefit, and also you do not lose anything. You do not lose anything. So knowledge has a strategy. Knowledge has, has a strategy. To be patient, and humble, you know, consult your scholars to learn how to seek this knowledge in the in life and social you will, you will succeed. And the last thing I will, I will mention is about restricting, you know, the amount of the engagement in the dunya things. Restricting yourself. I'm not saying not to be involved in the dunya, but this huge amount of time that we are wasting on our phones, please, my dear students, understand the value of what you're looking for. Restrict yourself from it. Use the phone when it, whenever it is necessary. When it is necessary, get it off. Keep it aside. This is why I call smartness. You know? This is why I call smartness. You know, sometimes I see these rich people, very rich people. Whatever phone do you see in their hands sometimes? That simple Nokia that you buy, 30 ringgit, 40 ringgit. And you see somebody who is struggling to, struggling to find something to eat, holding a huge amount of food. That, as following from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but as a student of knowledge, do not let these devices distract you from that which is more important and more valuable. In the future, knowledge can lead you to a situation whereby the ibnillah, you can buy the whole company that is making the phones itself. The ability yourself, madhalika Allah bi aziz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to do everything. And lastly, my dear brothers and sisters, be a mean. Maintain the amount, whatever you do. Make sure, make sure that you understand that knowledge is an amana between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And during the learning process, don't you ever cheat in your learning. No cheating in the learning. And also no cheating during the exams. Because when you cheat during the exam, what happens is in the future, you're going to be employed, you know, and working, you know, with what? A fake certificate, which is going to affect your earning throughout your life. You might find it okay, but it is not. It is better for you to get zero than taking you know, the answer from others in the way it goes against the university policies. That's what is called cheating. The Prophet said, Man minna. whoever cheat is not one of us. So understand that knowledge is amana. It is a religious act of worship. If you don't do it in the way Allah SWT wants and you, you know, you know, you know, cheat in terms of learning, at the end of the day, Allah SWT will not support you in that. So dear brothers and sisters, I will summarize some of the, uh, uh, these, these qualities that I have mentioned because of their importance. Number one, I said, Sincerity, being sincere in whatever you do. Number two, you have the patience, patience with everyone. Number three, you have the time management. Number four, you have good friends you know, to help you. Number five, you have the one step, this is a reading, reading a lot. You have the one step, this is a reading a lot. Uh, number five, you have uh, a tawadu, humbleness. Number six, number six, you have lack of shyness when asking the scholars. Number eight, uh, number seven is Adam Bulish Shigali Umur Dunya, restricting the amount of the time you're spending on the worldly affairs. And the last one is 
the amana, understanding that knowledge is amana on your shoulder, and Allah SWT is going to put you over. This is amana, and therefore, you have to be sincere and not to cheat throughout your uh, journey in learning. May Allah SWT grant you good and uh, be with you, and I ask Allah SWT to help you to succeed in your education, and may Allah SWT grant you better than what you're looking for. إنه بكل جميل كثير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك استغفر إن شاء الله إذا لم يسألني سؤال أنا سعيد لأن أعرف أنك when in class or when uh, we speak uh, knowledge. Uh, some of the important uh, highlights that I want to share is the student depression uh, uh, in the knowledge, respect the Ulam of respect or lecture, and so uh, the interest in study. Uh, hopefully, all of us will benefit as much as we can from our Dr. Brian sharing just now. Uh, Inshallah, we'll now open uh, question and answer session. You have, if you have any question, you may write them in the chat box, or you can open your mic. Uh, yeah, we have two, uh, two questions. Um, by what criteria uh, a person will be considered as a scholar in the lens of Islam? And the number two, what are the books that we should read to guide us uh, to be true students of, uh, of knowledge as well as for us to manage our better? And is that, uh, the lastly, number three. Uh, what are considered, what are considered as harsh books for common people? Uh, Dr. Your, your mic. Uh, first of all, a uh, person to be considered as a scholar, he has to be well versed in that discipline which he is specializing on. You know, every discipline has its own requirements and conditions. So a person is a well-versed in that discipline. You know, study from the scholars, graduate and got all the principles and read a lot. And the way the vast majority of the question being passed on that discipline, the person is able to answer. Yeah, this is a, when we can call a person a scholar in that, in that field. Otherwise you have many scholars, because if I learn a juz'iyah, a juz'iyah means a part of something. I am a scholar concerning that thing which I learned. The person who doesn't know, you know, when I teach him that thing, I'm his chef. But as far as scholarship is concerned, somebody who is going to be a reliable person in the community to solve their issues, you need to be well versed into that discipline which you're trying to specialize in. Then we call you a scholar of that, of that discipline. Otherwise, the person will remain having that status of uh, study until the time he reaches that point. That's why we have the mujtahideen, those people who are called mujtahideen, you know, Umar Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the person doesn't become a mujtahid just because you study in a university or uh, institution. <laughs> there are a lot, a lot, a lot to be done. Those people who are qualified mujtahideen, they spend almost all of their life learning, reading, traveling, taking a journey, you know, so many difficulties they have encountered for them to reach that, that point. I'm saying here, uh, is that a person should be well versed in the discipline, you know, and getting almost most of the basics, you know, in that discipline. In the way now he's left by the scholars, you know, to go and expand the knowledge by himself. And he reads a lot while he was, while he was with the scholars and they clarify to him any obstacle that he might be facing, you know, in, uh, the process of expanding his knowledge. And also, uh, when it comes to the second question about the books, this one, a student of knowledge should always refer to the one who is teaching. 
you have your teacher, you should ask your teacher what type of books I should be reading to expand my knowledge concerning this course I have, I have taken. So we cannot generalize. So we say it depends on what the person is learning and a person should always be in contact right, with, with his professors and the lecturers and the teachers. And concerning the food, harsh food is to eat food which are very rough, not good almost, almost to everyone culture. It's a good idea, eating dry food, not, uh, they, they are not uh, tasty at all, you know? but you are eating the harsh food, you also don't like them, but you're eating them because you think this is what Allah SWT wants. You know, there are some people who don't eat meat, there are some people who don't eat nice food, they think this is following the dunya. These are all wrong practices by, you know, uh, some among the members of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah wants you to look for the best. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you uh, give him food, he looks for the best amongst uh, the, 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 the food you are presenting to him. That's why they even know that the best meat to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the front leg of a sheep. He has something that he called the best thing for him. And when you give the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam food, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be looking for that which he loves more in that food and eat it. And they mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ibn Qayyim says, he never ate food after it is uh, been, uh, what do you call, uh, you, you warm it you know, for him in the morning so that he can eat it. He always eat fresh as much as he can. <laughs> So this is a very important uh, question. Harsh food means things that are not interesting to you and to the vast majority of the people. And they're very low quality. They lack so many things and they're very harsh. You know? They're very harsh. You know? and there are some people who don't eat soup. They just eat uh, the bread just like that. They mentioned that one of the causes of the illness of Imam Bukhari was this, because he doesn't eat hubs, you know, bread with soup. He doesn't mix it with anything. It caused him a problem in his, in his life. Imagine somebody who is rejecting the look of things. It's not like they ask him about this, but he was his own mother and Aqidah. But as I said, uh, uh, the, the, the method of the Prophet Sallallahu in this regard is always the best to be followed. Eat fresh food whenever you can find it. As, as much as you can. And as, especially the student of knowledge, you really need fresh food for your brain to be, uh, to be strong and strong and strong so that you can be able to memorize things that your scholars are saying about. Uh, we have an additional one question. Chef, as a, as a fast food considered as harsh food? Yeah? Harshness, I'm not talking about the harshness in terms of the <laughs> yeah, them being hard. So a fast food is not. Was uh, very healthy. This one, uh, inshallah, when I become uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, a medical doctor, then I can answer this question. <laughs> uh, another question from me. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, about the three groups that enter uh, the hell yearly than other groups, uh, is specified just only on uh, Islamic study for the Alif, or it can be considered on all studies, including economy. Uh, psychology or other than that. Yeah. Any knowledge that is supposed to be done for the sake of Allah, any knowledge that is supposed to be done for the sake of Allah, if a person does it for the sake of somebody, it's included. So the first one that is included, 100% is the Islamic knowledge. And other than that, any knowledge in this dunya that is supposed to be done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person is doing it for other than Allah, will be great in the hero. So that is a big doubt, you know, big shubha for somebody who studies the dunya knowledge and he's doing it for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's losing the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at least. And Imam Shafi used to see these disciplines as half of the deen. But he asked him about uh, seeking uh, uh, medis medical you know, support from a Jew. He was mad at, at the Muslims when somebody asked him, can I visit a medical doctor that is not a Muslim? So he was saying, what happened to the Muslim community? They left half of their deen to be handled by, by who? By the non-Muslims. 
He called medicine half of the deed. So we have to be very careful. Any knowledge that is beneficial to uh, the Ummah, person should do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't worry about the dunya. It will come. When you do it for Allah and you perfect it and you study hard, you will get the dunya. You will not lose it. But if you don't do it by, uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you might get the dunya, you might not get the dunya. So you lost both ways. You, know? you lost the side of Allah and also you lost the side of the dunya also as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good and tawfiq. Alhamdulillah, uh, for the, we have finished our question uh, session. Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. Uh, again, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ibrahim for tonight's session, and hopefully we can apply all of the knowledge that Mr. Ibrahim had shared with us uh, tonight, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, uh, we have, have come uh, to the end of tonight's session. Uh, your participant is highly appreciated. Uh, we Allah SWT, uh, best all the knowledge that we get from this program. Before we end, uh, we, will have, we will have uh, some photography uh, session. Uh, if you want to switch on your camera, feel free to do. Uh, I will pass uh, it to Sister uh, Ella uh, for the photography session. <laughs> Okay, everyone, please open uh, your cameras and put on your biggest smile, please. Okay. Is every, everyone ready? Okay.